Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Prologue. This is our second holiday uh, Prologue event, and I'm very, very excited by our guest. I'm excited by every guest we have, but particularly today, um, we'll be um, talking with Jessica Hansen, who is a long friend of mine, um, who we went to graduate school together. You know her voice, I'm sure, if you listen to NPR, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what she does at NPR. She's also an accomplished actress. You may have seen her on Parks and Rec, um, and many, many other things. I don't wanna to spend too much time introducing because the first question I'm gonna throw is gonna be an introduction. And so without further ado, I just wanna say, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us uh, on Prologue tonight. Oh, thank you for having me, Kevin. It's lovely to be here and it's lovely to see you. So I, I gotta admit, I mean, as I said, we've been friends for how long, a long time. Um, uh -huh. we, were, <laughs> we were chit chatting, I think it was the, the election. We were texting back and forth and we were, and something around NPR came up and you have one of those realizations. They're like, oh my gosh, my friend's kind of a big deal. And <laughs> I always knew it was <laughs> so interesting. And what she has done with her career is so interesting. I wanna introduce her to, um, to our community, to, um, to our students because uh, you kind of do it all. You're a triple, quadruple threat. And, and I wonder Aww. if you could start, well, it's true. Uh, if you could just start by telling us, most people listening, I think probably know you from the radio or know your voice from the radio. So before we talk mm -hmm. about here, could you talk about how you got into to radio? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a convoluted story. I'll try to keep it short because we only have 45 minutes here. <laughs> and you want to ask other questions. Maybe. Um, so out of graduate school, I was doing the actor's life and I was running around 17 hour days, eight days a week and doing film and television and theater and live gigs and everything I could get my hands on. And I started a theater company because what better thing to do than start a theater company when you're already running around like a chicken with your head cut off. And we were making um, radio versions of Shakespeare and other stuff that kids have to read in school, like The Scarlet Letter. And um, so I was sort of still coalescing what I knew about voice and acting. And I was learning a lot about microphones and how to, how to act for the microphone. And over the course of the 10 years that, that I ran this company, um, it became more and more crystal clear to me how to help actors separate their voices into different parts. Because if you're playing three or four different roles on the stage, you've got costumes and body language and many other cues to help people understand you're playing a different character. But on the radio, if your voice is even remotely the same, people are getting confused. And Shakespeare is confusing enough, right? <laughs> so, um, so I started working with other theater companies doing voice coaching, dialect coaching. And then when we were working with my local NPR station here in Washington, DC, they were picking up our shows, that underwriting position came open and they auditioned me for it heavily. It was the most rigorous audition process, harder than graduate school, much harder than parks and recreation. It was insane, but I got the gig and I did that gig for a while four years or so until the NPR gig opened up and I applied for the NPR gig and they didn't hire me. They didn't interview me. They didn't consider me and they hired somebody else entirely. But I went down there anyway and I said, do you have somebody to fill in when she's sick or on vacation? And they said, oh, great idea. Would you be interested? So I started filling in for her and eventually the job grew and there was, there was more because podcasts were exploding. And so um, lo and behold, they offered me a six month contract. And I will confess to you that I thought about it a long time. I asked them to have a week to think about this contract. Did I wanna go to the same office and sit in a desk every day with the same people? I didn't think I could handle it after being a freelance artist and running around and meeting new people. And, um, but it turns out journalists are a lot like theater artists. They dive into a story, immerse themselves in the world, they go hard, they have incredible passion and integrity. And then, you know, the show's about to air or, you know, the podcast is about to launch or whatever. Somebody pulls a whiskey bottle out of a desk, they have a cast party on the terrace, bada bing, bada boom, it's opening night. It's great. <laughs> Does that answer your question? So I, I have no idea. Does. Now, but it also, it opens up a whole bunch of other questions. Um, not that we'll get to the whiskey part later, but oh. Uh, <laughs> so, 
just because you mentioned the audition process, I have to ask you that. What, 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 what is an audition process for radio and why was it yeah. so Yeah, so I, that depends from show to show, from station to station, from product to product, it depends. Um, in this case, they, they put me in a room with some copy, some underwriting copy, and it looks like there were five or six people in the room, but there were other people like hiding behind the walls. You know, there's a big window where you can see some of the people, there's an engineer, there's a director, there's the person who brought you in and got you your water. And then there were like program directors and news directors hiding where I couldn't see them. So at some point people popped out from behind <laughs> the wall and were like, Jessica, that was great. Could you do it like this? Who are you? <laughs> and then there was a callback that was similar. And I think there were maybe 18 people stuffed in that room and probably like two or three weeks in between the initial audition and the callback, it was it was bonkers. It was bananas. And they were giving me words like, you know, the Sanju K. Bonsal Foundation. I mean, cut a girl a break on her audition, right? <laughs> but they wanted to know, can she pronounce crazy things? Can she handle difficult text? Because that's what that's what it was day in and day out. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you do now um, for NPR. Okay. So um, it is a full-time job, which very often shocks people. Um, I am voicing somewhere between five and eight hours a week. And the rest of my time, I do eight hours of voice coaching a week. And then there's producing, there's sort of trafficking. I have to time the copy to make sure that it fits into the time allotment. There's a bunch of weird admin stuff that you would never think about. And then occasionally I actually get to edit. I do the audio editing. From time to time. I used to, when I was at the local, I did all my own editing, but at the, at the, at NPR headquarters, we have several producers on a big team. And they all pitch in. <laughs> so we, I mean, a lot of people know your voice. Anyone who listened to NPR, wh where do we hear you on NPR? Because it's like, yeah. watch NPR, you watch radio hosts uh, like uh, on, on a screen and you're like, wait, I know that voice, but now there's a human being attached to it. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 so yeah. We hear you when we're, when we're listening. Yeah. That's so funny you say that. The first time I was in an elevator with Robert Siegel, I had that exact experience. I was like, he's talking, but who is he? <laughs> um, so you hear me in all the funding credit breaks talking about Atlassian and Squarespace and C3.ai um, and sometimes even Pajamagram, although I haven't said Pajamagram this holiday season and I'm, I'm very sad about that. Um, so you hear me three times an hour during morning edition and all things considered and fresh air and 1A and, 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 and. There are a bunch of little other slots, um, smaller shows. If you are one, what we call an NPR core listener and you've got the radio on all, all the time when you're awake, you probably hear me 20 or 30 times a day. Wow. And P.S. If you want to say pajamagram anytime, just because you haven't in a while, I'm sure. I'm sure they would be happy that you're for the you're cats at. and dogs too. So. <laughs> Terrific. So I want to get into the, the the nuts and bolts of of radio. So if someone says, "Oh, that person has radio voice," um, I think mm. you've probably heard someone say that. I've said that before. What do you, what do you, what distinguishes for you radio voice, and what are some of the yeah. key things that you listen for? Yeah, so this is a really, okay, we could talk about this for like an hour. This is a really interesting concept because people think about radio voice and sometimes they're hearkening back to the days of yore, the golden age of radio, and they're thinking about sonorous, resonant, deep, rich voices. And sometimes they're, you know, I mean, you're, there's commercial radio. People are thinking about like, bah, 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 hurry on down to guys used card lot, <laughs> selling out now. And sometimes, you know, now with the world of podcasts, radio voice sometimes is actually podcast voice, which is a much more chatty, conversational, laid back, you know, easygoing, you know, pull up a, pull up a chair, sit next to me on the sofa kind of quality. Um, I was asked this on, on another podcast just the other day about what is NPR voice? What is, what is the NPR sound? And I think, in terms of public radio, it's more about the quality of the information than what the voice sounds like. Because, I mean, we've left the days of Walter Cronkite, we've left the days of um, Tim Russert, your old pal. We've left the days of, you know, there's this authoritative figure who's 
issuing information and it's up to you to consume it. Now the sound is really much more who sound like who you are, where you're from, and invite somebody in. Hey, I've got some information and come on in. You might be interested. Check it out, you know? And so we have voices from, you know, brand new people who are in their 20s, who are new to the field, to people who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s even, who've been in the field forever. And they sound wildly different. There is no cohesive sound, but they all do at least attempt to sound genuine and authentic and present in the moment, which we'll get back to you when you ask me about theater, because I know you're gonna. I will. I, you know, it's, I was just thinking as you were talking about that, I was reminded of a story myself, um, going to an audition, doing coming for a callback for a news anchor. And, mm -hmm. and, and the casting director for whatever that was hadn't actually seen me, but the, the casting that someone else had recommended me. I came in and they saw that I didn't have any hair and they're like, oh, <laughs> no, you don't know, right there. And now we turn on the TV and, uh, and uh, yeah, there was a look, right? That was so, what an yeah. anchor had to look yeah. devastating, obviously, I yeah. remember 20 years later. Um, but at the same time, it, it has resonance for me based on what you said, which is there isn't necessarily a right voice. Um, yeah, much yeah. More is, 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 you know, being the authentic voice that you are. Yeah, I mean, diversity and inclusion are not just buzzwords. I mean, it really is where, where the industry has gone and will continue to go, you know, women, some, a lot of young men even still are trying to press their voices down to sound authoritative and to give themselves a quality of gravitas. And a big part of my job day in and day out is to say, knock it off, be who you are. People want to hear who you are. You know, when you are truly yourself, and comfortable in yourself, that's more inviting. I would rather listen to somebody that's not straining or trying. I would rather listen to somebody that's just, hey, you know, come here, check it out. That inviting, welcoming quality is what makes us lean in and say, yeah, what have you got? I wanna know. Right. You know, I, I wanna talk about some of those specific things that you noticed and that you work with NPR talent on, but before I go there, um, who are some examples, and you can name names or not, I don't want to put you, <laughs> put you in an uncomfortable situation, but who are some uh, radio voices that you you are grav you gravitate to, or when you were growing up, you listened to, and, and for some mm -hmm. reason, they had a, a strength for you? Yeah, so I'm what they call an NPR car seat listener. I grew up listening to NPR as a baby, um, and I couldn't name any of those names. I have no idea, but now, right now, today, some of the folks that I love listening to are Elsa Chang, who is one of our hosts from the West Coast, um, Ari Shapiro, who um, I think has the best capability of breaking bad news. He has a really, if something really horrible or serious has happened, he's got a way of just sort of like putting his vocal arm around your shoulder and saying, you know, I'm here with you and we're gonna get through this together. Um, and Bob Mondello, who's on the arts desk and does the movies, I could listen to him tell me about movies all day. I don't care if it's a movie I'm gonna see or not. It's just, it's lovely to listen to him telling the stories. And I think what all of them have in common is that, that relaxed quality that they're just, you know, doing their thing. And, and it's easy, as one of our professors used to say, with ease, ease, yes. e, right? <laughs> Work with ease, you know, um, that, that trying too hard or trying to be something you're not creates that sensation of like arm's length. It puts up some invisible wall between you and who's listening. Um, and this is true on the stage too. You know, if you, if you relax into the decisions that you've chosen and you trust the foundation that you've built, you work with ease. If you're trying to do the work while you're on stage, uh, the audience can feel you like, the gears are grinding. It's not. You know, that's that's so important. And I think for our, our students who are listening too, to remember that both in radio, but, but on stage is is that, that tension and the lack of ease that we bring because somehow we think it gives the character more power. I'm, out, I'm playing mm. leader, I gotta be tense and over the top. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you don't, I mean. Quite but authority and confidence read 
with I'm comfortable with who I am and, and the decisions I'm making. Um, well, with the you, know, I'm, I'm, you said, and but I there's heard. also there's also that tension that that comes from conflict, right? right? But that's you know if you I wish we had like a live audience right now and I could <laughs> I could do a little exercise with them, you know, like like say you know mama hi mama and then tense up your shoulders in your throat and say hi mama and it doesn't come out right so if you say um whatever your line is even if you're angry there's like force behind it but it's still you know there's still fluidity there's still motion there's still freedom it's not i am so angry <laughs> you know well i mean to, to that point uh, tell us a little bit about when you're when you're um, recording um, track, are do you stand? Do you sit? Do you warm up? I mean, how do you prepare the body for for the ease that you need to convey? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, first of all, um, as our former professor would say, um, Mari Lowry, shout out. Um, it, does a professional basketball player go from the parking lot into the locker room and put on the uniform and then start the game? No. You go up and down the court doing the drills and shooting the baskets before the game. You have to warm up. Does a professional violinist walk into the concert hall and take the cold violin out of the case and start playing the symphony? No, you have to tune the darn thing. So when our bodies are our instruments, yes, we have to warm up. I do warm up. I spend a good part of my days either doing my own warm up or teaching other people how to work. And so by the time I open the mic, it's all... I mean, God willing, it's all flowing freely. Um, if something happens, if there's construction next door and I'm a little tense, I have to do an extra shaky shake, that's fine. Um, what was the first part of your question before you said warming up? I forgot what you said. Uh, I don't know. What was the first part? I don't part either. Of you? I don't know. you yeah. answered it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to if we were live, someone in the audience would yell out the question. Would shout it out, yeah. <laughs> And someone is doing that at home right now. Uh, so I, asked, <laughs> I went down this road on, on warm ups, but I, I asked you about some of the, the, the vocal qualities. And I love the idea. Was it Ari Shapiro? The idea of yeah. reporting bad news is like your vocal, yeah. beautiful way of putting it. And, 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 and again, going back to like that Lear example, something horrible has happened. I need to have his attention. And you see that in reporters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because of that calm that he brings. Yeah, I mean, there are actors. Yeah, I mean, we all know this, right? Like how to stop acting, right? And, and there are reporters who think, I have to sound like this is important. No, it is important. The words communicate that, whether it's theater or radio, whether it's journalism or a podcast, the word hurricane always means hurricane. And you, you, can, you can infuse it with something but you don't have to give it importance. It is important. Right. What you have to do is have your objective, your point of view. What is your goal? What do you want to do? How do you want to? How do you want to deliver this? What do you want to do with this hurricane? Do you want to comfort? Mm -hmm. Do you want to um, inspire? Do you want to educate? Do you want to frighten? God, I hope not. Um, but there are. I mean, you have options. And at the end of the day, if you're like hey, there was a hurricane and here's what we know so far. You know, you're, you're pulling your audience in and saying, stay with me, it's gonna be okay, we're gonna figure this out. Or, you know, are you saying, there was a hurricane and uh, we're gonna learn more soon. Then you're just making your audience nervous, right? Your audience is going, oh, oh God, how bad is it? You don't wanna do that. Everybody's yeah. already worried. Well, I think this this segues in really nicely, Jessica, to some of the, the core things I want to get at, which are what are some of the common things? I should, I don't want to be negative, but the common mistakes that, you know, most of our audience probably isn't a radio personality. I'm not a radio personality, but we all, for the most part, many of us um, um, speak every day. What are the things that we do or what are the things that radio personalities do that irk you? <laughs> and yeah, what are some yeah, of the yeah, ways yeah. we can address them to get better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not a radio personality, but now you're a YouTube personality, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so um, I, I think a lot of the common problems are things that you hear um, when people aren't being careful with the performance, right? 
a lot of the a lot of the podcast hosts are trying to be really conversational and chatty and they lose that level of performance the care i mean it is still a performance even though you are trying to be more intimate and more informal you still are opening a microphone and laying down a track so um i think a lot of those come from lack of breath support i think i said to you the other day people aren't breathing people just aren't breathing <laughs> And so it leads to all kinds of things like falling line and um, vocal fry and um, a lack of tone, you know, just a lack of being able to hear the person. Yeah. So in case people don't know what falling line is, I know a lot of these folks yeah, let's students who know that. that, but let's back up. Yeah. So um, falling line sounds like you're reading. If I'm using falling line, I'm saying all of my lines like this and all of my sentences end the same. And I like Kevin's Christmas tree in the background and also the poinsettia. And you start to hear that pattern and you're like, this person is just reading these sentences and my brain knows what's gonna happen. So I can just think about what's for dinner instead. You know? And it's Should totally I mean? common. Um, you oh, see it on stage, you hear it on radio, in, in conversations with people, the, the yeah. just that, that, well, or like a down glide, right? I mean, the, the, uh -huh. the, you're, uh -huh. you're, you're, you're getting yeah. to the end of the sentence. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> and so they lose energy. Yeah, right. Well, why do why do you know the reasoning this is developed? Because it's so pervasive. I think it's just because people are looking at the period at the end of the sentence and they think they're done, <laughs> and they don't have to keep using energy. And one of the things that I coach my folks to do is to take out all the periods. Um, I mean, your students probably put in slash marks or whatever to mark beats and such. Um, and I coach my journalists and podcast hosts to not write sentences like print because reading is in a different part of your brain from speaking. So we speak in ideas. Here's a thought, here's a thought, here's a thought. So take out all the punctuation and write it like a poem, write a verse line and no periods and no commas until you get to the end. And the end is when you say, you know, thanks for listening, I'm so-and-so. And even then, it's still not the very end because then there's a handoff to something else. Then there's a newscast or then there's the next podcast they're listening to or whatever. The energy still needs to go. Even when you're done, you're still saying, thank you for listening. My name is Jessica Hansen. And it's still going, right? There's still... Yeah. <sighs> right? It doesn't go, thank you for listening. My name is Jessica Hanson. Yeah. <laughs> so that's falling line, which again- That's we'll falling line. line. The one that I know drives me crazy, but I also know it's also pervasive and I know I slip into it sometimes is vocal fry. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about vocal fry, which I am convinced yeah. I don't know this, that it's getting more and more pervasive. Yeah, so vocal fry stylistically, I'm, it's a choice and I'm not gonna even get into the battle of sexism and, and all of that because there's so much you can read. For me, it's a matter, for, for people who are on the radio or podcast, it's a matter of being heard because if, if somebody's listening to the radio in their car, in the kitchen, if somebody's listening to a podcast on the Metro, on their bicycle, whatever, there's background noise. There's always, always background noise and if, and if somebody's talking like this, there's just not enough tone. And the background noise will wipe out all of the tone. But if, if, you, have, if you have full tone and full resonance, a little background noise isn't gonna drown me out, right? So for me, it's about being heard. It's about being fully present, like you always should be on the stage, being fully, fully present vocally, so that not only are you not drowned out by the passing truck, but also people feel like they can connect with you. People feel like Jessica is fully there telling me about Atlassian's latest product. Jessica is really telling me about Trello or King Lear is really banishing his daughter right now. What a crazy dude. So if, if you take away even part of that, even if you're just like a little bit breathy or if you drop back into your fry a little bit, there's so much of of my voice that you're not hearing so much range overtones and undertones and and colors and qualities they're all just gone and to deny your audience of all of that spectrum 
Why would you do that? Yeah. So Fry then, I mean, and I, you said it, and well, I, and we, we all can do it in like some form or fashion and we do it, it's like pulling that voice back into the throat, right? Where it almost, ah, it literally yeah. sounds like it's frying. Yeah, uh, like you're popping popcorn back there. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Uh, and it's not good for the vocal cords, I can imagine, either. It's not. You know, um, I used to talk about the health of the vocal cords because when you have full tone, the cords meet up beautifully. Mm -hmm. And you can you can look this up on YouTube. You can search go, Google um, uh, vocal fry camera or something, and you can see the vocal folds are flopping all around and they're not meeting properly. And I've known people who spoke with so much fry that they've had to have surgery for nodes. And then they have to go see an ENT and have like physical therapy for their voices to recover. And so, you know, in terms of health, yes. On the other hand, there are people who've practiced vocal fry for so many years, their voices never get sore or tired. So, you know. <laughs> I guess they're just working with really strong calluses and, and they figured out a way, I don't know. But it still negates all of their person that we could be hearing. And for me, I wanna hear really all of who you are. People say the eyes are the window to the soul, but I think that the voice offers so much, so much color and texture and you can be so intimate with your voice. Um, why, why deprive your listeners of all that you have to give them? Um, the, the other one that I know we've talked about before, and I don't know if this is the technical term, but upspeak. Um, yeah. Could you say a little bit about that? And it's sort of like the opposite of falling line, is it not? Or, or... Um, what do you mean? I mean, I guess you're talking about upspeak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the opposite of falling line. Um, and a, I've run into many a journalist who came into a job new in their careers, male and female, who had some upspeak and they kept ending all of their stories like this, all of their sentences stopped like this because they were leading into the next one. And because somebody said, you have to sound more serious, their answer to that was to push their voice really far down and sound monotonous, which is just a different problem. It's not better, <laughs> it's just a different problem. Um, so, what I, what I try to tell folks who have upspeak is if you can go up and you can go down, then what happens if you go straight through? What happens if you just keep driving forward and, and start high and end low or start low and end high and then find out what are the variants in between there? Because um, if you can do one and you can do the other, then you can do everything in between, right? It's just a matter of playing and sometimes People are a little hesitant to explore, but I think I think that's the key to it is just letting yourself. All right, I'm going to do this 16 times and every way is going to be different and I'm not tracking any of these. None of these are going to go live to air. So what have I got and then listen back and see, oh, that sounds like a person just talking. That's what I want. I just, I, I have to just double down on this idea of the, it, well, there's the book, of course, Free and the Natural Voice, but the idea that you have to be natural. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I was talking to my brother earlier. He's a fire firefighter. He's going to kill me that I'm saying this, but, uh, but he's just like, yeah, yeah, you know, we're in the, and we're, you know, in the truck and we're like friends and we're all talking and then we have to get on the radio and all of a sudden it's, this is Landis, you know, and it was like, oh, this, we, and we, all have, we all have ways that we do that. I, everyone says, oh, Kevin, you're using your pro prologue voice. And like, oh, but I should be freeing my natural voice. It should. Be. Well, yes and no. I mean, as long as you're using your whole voice, we do this, right? We put on suits when we're trying to be professional and we put on our pajamas when we're with our family and we do this vocally and that's okay. You know, when we're seducing a lover, we use a different voice than when we're in a job interview and that's okay. But all of those voices, all of those, um, all of those wardrobes for our voices can still be on a free and open voice. The difference is if you're in a job interview and you're trying to be important and so you just sound monotonous and you flatten your voice and you're not using your color and tone or yeah i mean it would be like talking to a lover with like i think you're so pretty in this light i mean it doesn't work right just 
you know, as long as you're moving with ease and letting, letting it all just fly out naturally, your imagination will provide color. Your imagination and your intentions, who you're talking to and, and what you want to accomplish will change your voice. But that's what it means to have a free voice is that your voice can move and it can put on a different wardrobe. It can put on a different outfit for a different circumstance, right? Yeah, and there's another thing I wanted you to talk a little bit about, Jessica. And again, I don't know any of the technical terms that um, maybe there is one. I texted Jessica earlier and I said, what's that thing when you sound boring? <laughs> sounding boring. And I said, sounding boring. Um, but I kind of what I get, wanted to get to um, is I call it like the schwa, like the uh, instead of saying to, people say to, or yeah. they just you know, laze their way yeah. through words or don't hit t's like didn't rather than you know didn't yeah um, yeah yeah and there's a difference between voice for stage voice for broadcast radio and voice for podcasts stage has the most heightened speech you have to you have to get those t's and p's they have to go out because they have to make it to the back of the hall and Voice for broadcast, you have to have really clear enunciation, but it can't be stage enunciation or you will sound over articulated mm -hmm. because the, the microphone's right here. You know, it's like every audience person's ear is right there. You're not, you're not trying to reach the back of the hall or, or the outer reaches of the amphitheater. Every audience member is four inches to six inches from my mouth. Mm -hmm. So you still wanna be clear and then, the, and then the podcast, the general understanding of the podcast, most podcasts, is that it's just you and me, and we're sitting at a cafe having a cup of coffee together, and it's just how I would really talk, except it's still a performance. So even though you're trying to sound chatty and conversational and natural, you still have to be clear enough. So it's not maybe as clear and formal as broadcast, which is nowhere near the precision in articulation of stage. But still, I mean, you have to be careful. You know, as I look at some of the evolution of the way voice has, has been taught, and I talked to my, my, I'm going to do a shout out to my dear colleague, Leah Chandler Mills, who teach, speak, teaches voice for us and is just fabulous. And students take class with Leah Chandler Mills. You'll learn how to speak really, really beautiful. And one of the things we talk about is the evolution of voice training over, over her career and mm. over, over our careers as well. And I hear students a lot say something to the effect of, oh, I need to, you know, they might have an accent. Maybe it's a, mm -hmm. an accent from another country or a regional accent. Like, I got to get rid of that. And there was a time that vocal teachers might say, yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. We're like, no, at this point, no, yeah. this, we yeah. have to embrace the yeah. fullness and the richness of your natural voice. Is that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right on that assessment? Yeah. And um, in my experience coaching, there there is definitely a desire for there to be a diversity of voices. And that means diversity of dialects and accents. And um, for you students, if you don't know the difference, go look it up. And for the rest of the audience. We just um, finger wag twice. I know <laughs> students, no, sorry. <laughs> I do take class with Leah. <laughs> sorry, you can Jessica. tell we have the same training. <laughs> So for the rest of the audience who's not a student and doesn't have to go do the research, um, a dialect is um, variations on the way one language is spoken and an accent as if this language is your second language. So um, dialects in English would be a Southern dialect, a Midwestern dialect, uh, a New England dialect, which we all had to learn when we toured our town. <laughs> Whereas an accent would be if um, French or um, Japanese or Spanish or Mandarin were your first language and you speak English with an accent. Either way, um, all of those are now welcome and, ex and even sought after. You know, the standard American dialect or going back a little further, the mid-Atlantic is yeah. no longer the goal. And in fact, I've lost many a job for having perfect speech. <laughs> so, it's, it's true that yes, we're looking for people who sound different and interesting from around the world. We want that. And, and we're reflecting what this country and what the world is. However, 
it still has to be articulate enough that it's that it's legible that we can understand what's being said and if the accent is too thick then yes we need some you know accent reduction not eradication but a little bit of clarifying so that the audience can hear and understand because at the end of the day what we're doing is communicating whether it's on stage or radio or podcast we're communicating we're trying to share a story and so if the audience doesn't get the story or doesn't understand we've we've lost our goal so well that yes to yes to what you said <laughs> what did i say kevin is right everybody that's <laughs> no, all no, no. I, I, like, I want to make sure we're, we're clear that we we've developed from this sense of a correction oh, yeah. um oh yeah oh yeah absolutely but then again i i i asked the sort of the follow-up i mean you talked about being able to be understood and of course you know, that brings up whole number of questions of who's trying to understand you and what your audience is. And then uh -huh. national public radio and your voice is going across the country. Yeah. Isn't there still then, if you're a national broadcasting company, some stuff that you have to be aware of when it's such a, a huge array of people you're Yeah, hearing? yeah, yeah. You're getting murky. It's good. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, no. It's true. It's true. I mean, it's absolutely true. I have... I have had clients who, um, I won't name any names, she's one of my favorite clients, who um, she is from West Tennessee and she has somebody who's from East Tennessee and she doesn't understand them. It's her own employee. And, and we're talking about two different dialects in Tennessee. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, when you're trying to appeal to a national audience, it includes and a plethora. I mean, there, it's endless numbers of, of how ears hear and what they're used to hearing. So you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's um, you're sort of looking for like some sort of biggest possible median. Um, at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, we get complaints from this part of the country that they can't understand somebody from that part of the country. And that's okay, because sometimes it's our job to challenge our audiences to grow. You know, the world is changing and come along with us. I know I said we talk a little bit about stage as well, and we have. And now, here, of course, we're like, we only have five or, five or 10 more minutes, but let's talk a wee bit about stage. Um, what distinguishes, you've talked a few about a few things, but if you look at your voice, Jessica Hansen, on the radio versus your voice on the stage, mm -hmm. what are the things that you notice are, that are the biggest differences? All right, I have to, I took notes today. I was tracking all things considered and I was like, oh, oh, oh. So I have to look at my notes. <laughs> if I don't say them all, I'm going to be sad. Okay. Um, so we talked about precision in articulation and, and articulation is less. Um, projection. When you're on stage, you have to use all of the bellows, right? If you did that into the microphone, people would be like, what are you doing? Stop yelling at me. Um, there is some degree of, some tiny degree of going off voice for the radio that can be, um, uh, I think we talked about this a while ago that you know, when, when you have a soft talker, it, it sort of makes people lean in and it could be a power play. Um, and so if you have this tiny little degree of just in, just engaging just a little bit more breath in the voice, 5%, 10%, not, not going super breathy, but just a little bit, it can be a little gentler, right? Oh, well, um, I, gotta, I gotta stop, Jessica. I gotta say, the, the, it reminds me, of course, because that's the rap, right? When people are making fun of National Public Radio. You know, there was yes. the Saturday Night Live thing, yes. right? Yes. Next, we're gonna be talking about rocks. I mean, it, the, the yes. totally breathy, yes. it's right in yes. my ear, and it's like, what? Yes, <laughs> yes, right. But on the other hand, when you're listening to the radio, I mean, I'm like, I'm like 3% off voice right now. When you're listening to the radio, and you hear somebody who's totally bright and totally on voice, you're like, ah, there's a commercial, right? So if you want it to be like, come on in. Yes, I mean, the joke is to go way off voice and be, ah, oh, welcome to National Public Radio. This is not the ideal. This is not what we're looking for. <laughs> not great, don't do that. Um, I, think, um, I think in both cases, it's still important to use your full vocal range. A lot of people are worried about 
using a specific slice of their voice for the radio. Whereas on stage, I think people feel more free um, to, you know, you've got more space, you've got more physical space to express so you can fill it and, and it's okay to use more range. And I think in the radio, people think, oh, well, this is my speaking voice, these three notes over and over and over again. And the rest of us are going, dear God, change it up. Um, so in both cases, with a new idea, you go, you pitch it up. Oh my gosh. And then there's this thing. And then there's this thing that's really sad. And then there's this thing that's interesting. And you have to use those, you know, placement of thoughts in various and um, vocal places, whether you're on stage or the radio, right? Yeah. I'd be remiss not to ask about film as well, because you're, mm. you know, you've done a lot of film work. Is there, is there sort of a middle ground between theater and radio voice or is that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So film is, is similar to radio in the, that the very specifics can be caught, you know, on film, if I raise my eyebrow, you see like a world of like, what did she, th what she thought, a huge expression. And the same can be true in radio. If you just place a little silence carefully, somebody's going to be like, oh, what was that, you know? Um, and the same is true, the microphone picks up, you know, more subtle things the camera, the camera, I think, is even stronger. You still have to be incredibly focused. It's just a different kind of focus. Mm -hmm. the, the, the camera, the microphone, and the stage all require a different, um, a different type of being crafted. You know, when you're on stage, a gesture can tell a story. You can, you can get a laugh from the audience with one little, <laughs> right? <laughs> and the same is true with film and radio. It's just a different, it's just a different focus of your precision. I have to ask, um, and, and I keep saying this is the last one, but I, I can't keep having more things I want to ask you about. Um, but so you've named some of the voices that you love to listen to. Um, NPR is is sort of considered the gold standard of sort of American radio in many ways. I mean, I know there's mm -hmm. lots of others, um, but. What are the what are the programs and 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 I guess specifically because of the host's voice or the way that they mm. they carry themselves vocally? What are the programs that you listen to and love the most um, that we might know and and why? Uh, that's not fair. Whoever I don't mention is going to get mad. No, but it's just, okay. <laughs> Jessica is going to mention one or two, even though there's loads of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I have to mention Guy Raz because he has the non-traditional, you know, he doesn't sound like all mellifluous and sonorous and gorgeous. He sounds quirky and he's unique and readily identifiable. And he's built a freaking empire on that. You can recognize his voice anywhere. And he does that kids podcast, Wow in the World. And he does How I Built This and he used to do Ted Radio Hour. And he is great. And this I, think is, this, I think, is really important, that anybody who's trying to get into radio or film or, or stage, you know, you think there are these prototypes of shoulds. And the answer is no. Be 100% yourself and be fully invested in that. Figure out what you are and how you're different and unique and wonderful. And go hard. Lean into that. Um, I think Guy Raz does a great, he does like the quirkiest phrasing, his voice is different from everybody else's. I love listening to him because it's not samey, 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 samey. Um, not to diss any of my other friends that I also love and adore for many other reasons. <laughs> Jessica, thank you so much. Because it's the holiday season, I was wondering, now that I've learned from you, we've all learned from you, I was wondering if you and I could read a wintry poem, yeah. Robert Frost, and then and then our our our, our technical guru Jared is going to run some photos of a beautiful snowy landscape, so that we can just hear the voices and look at the landscape. How does that sound? Is great. A, a that quote? sounds great. Do you, are you prepared to use your radio voice? Have you learned enough now? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to probably do stage voice and I'm going to blow it out of the water. Jared, are you, are you ready for us? Or, all right, Jared is giving us a nod. So anytime okay. you're ready and give us the countdown, okay. Jared. Just stay, stay, work with ease, Kevin. You're going to be great. Okay.
Whose woods these are I think I know. His house is in the village though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Jessica Hansen, it is so wonderful to see you and thank you so much for enlightening us with all of your wisdom tonight on this Aww. snowy winter night, wherever you happen to be. Um, and, um, and, and maybe sometime when, when life gets a little more normal, we can have you out to Colorado and, and you can work with our students and our community and- I would love to. Spread more wisdom. I would um, love to, great fun. <laughs> This is the time of the evening that I say good night and I, I, I say something to our sponsors, but since that's what you do professionally, I was wondering if you could take us off the air tonight. Absolutely, my pleasure. Prologue is made possible by the generous support from the Department of Visual and Performing Arts, the UCCS Chancellor's Office, the College of, whoa, the College of Letters, Arts and Sciences Dean's Office. That's a mouthful, I would rehearse that one a few times and from theater works. Prologue has thrived for over a decade thanks to the interest and support of people like you. Thanks for listening. Have a happy holiday season.